and we are live. Uh, I'm joined by returning champion Brian Summer. How we doing, Brian? Feeling good, feeling strong. I'm uh, I'm I'm ready to dive into whatever this topic is we're going to be doing today. It ought to be a good one. Yeah, it's going to be good. Sorry, we're starting late today on our legacy SaaS discussion, but Brian had to get his Whataburger T-shirt for you guys. That's right. So, you Brian, know, you show the Whataburger shirt. Yeah, I mean, everybody needs one of these. You know, it's in the shape of the state of Texas. And, uh, you know, there's the Whataburger with their ubiquitous triangular buildings and the Whataburger W. You know, that's, because that's handsome. You know, because you got to remember, John, Whataburger is Whataburger really ought to be. And, uh, you know, when you're in the Lone Star State, that's probably about the only thing you should be eating if you're thinking hamburger at that time. Anyway. Yeah, you uh, know, we make, I was making fun of Legacy SaaS, but Legacy Burger is a whole other matter. That, that legacy Whataburger is the right legacy. That's you, you that's know the one you want. I, I never was more embarrassed when I went through the drive-in at one of those with my mom, and she and she's from Iowa. I mean, you know, those are the kind of people that believe that spicy food is salt and pepper. And uh, she orders the jalapeno burger, and I look at my mom like, "Are you sure?" Because the peppers they serve down down there. Uh, there they get yeah, them in yeah, from southern deal. mexico that are like seriously hot she goes she looks at me and she goes son i've lived here now so long this stuff i'm immune to this stuff and they brought her and i figured what the hell if she can have one i will too i tell you what that burger made brought tears to my eyes my mom just powered on through hers uh, so you know uh and I'm not recommending that for most palates, but if you want it, it's there for you, buddy. Yep. yep. So, so for those for vendors, vendors who, uh, uh, oh, we got a little bit of an echo. Well, let's keep trying. Those vendors who complain about uh, Brian tossing uh, hot peppers at him, well, he learned it from his mom. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Anyhow, uh, welcome to today's discussion. SAS. Uh, SAS 2.0 is is the title of Brian's slide deck, but we're gonna, it's a master class, by the way, which is awesome. I've never been a part of a master class before, Brian, so this is pretty exciting. Well, I thought if you and I were going to be doing some schooling, uh, we might as well get credit for it. Uh, you know, now, of course, you don't get any continuing professional education credits for attending this, but you can pretend that you did. And I welcome everyone to mention this on their LinkedIn profile that they got this master class training from you and I on SAS 2.0. All righty. So let's let's frame this up because Brian, Brian's prepared an excellent deck for us that we're going to uh, deconstruct and, and talk about. Uh, and you're welcome to chime in on the comment thread. I'm sure we'll be seeing some comments from you shortly, so please do that. Uh, but let me just briefly explain the origins of this whole thing. Hey, Greg, service is a service. Yep, we're, that's, that's kind of where we're headed, Greg. I, we can't slip anything by you. Uh, so, so hey, uh, the way this started was kind of a developing concept I've been kicking around. It goes back to Freshworks a couple of years ago, uh, an analyst day, Alan Berkson organized it. So shout out to Alan, where kind of came up with this sort of notion of legacy SaaS. And uh, the, the basic deal behind legacy SaaS when I first was talking about it was this notion that there's some, a lot of times we, 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 pick, we pick on these software vendors We've been doing it for a while now. Who are kind of like faux cloud? Uh, they don't they don't know multi tenancy from like a garden shrub, and uh, <laughs> and 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 frankly, like the cloud washing is is pretty pitiful, and and we've kind of watched the evolution of that. But at the same time, a lot of really archaic business practices and such. So it's easy to criticize those vendors. But I started to feel like the industry darling SaaS vendors of enterprise software were getting a bit of a pass. And so this notion of legacy SaaS was kind of meant to tag vendors who aren't used to getting hauled into the fray so much because by comparison, uh, well, you know, the, the SaaS vendors prevent such a better user experience and value proposition that a lot of times they don't really get much criticism. So anyhow, that's kind of how the whole thing started. Freshworks took it and ran with it, but that's a whole different story. Uh, what I did more recently was on Disrupt TV. I crashed. I disrupted Disrupt TV, which is always fun. And I uh, presented some concepts around legacy SaaS that I had developed a little bit. And I'll share more of those later. That that's not really core to today's uh, pitch. But what is core to today's pitch is 
ba- the the basic thesis of my argument, which is, uh, let me just grab it here. I'm in the wrong file. The basic thesis of my argument is that the overriding lesson is that cloud software is not just economy of scale architecture and a better user experience. It should be a better way of doing business. Uh, I call it a customer-focused business transformation. That's that's really a mouthful. But basically, the, the software industry has not completed the transformation, and we need a way of calling that out, um, thus legacy SaaS. And I presented some concepts around that. What Brian has done in his glorious slideshow is he's taken that and kind of presented a different framework for it around SaaS 1.0 versus the more aspirational SAS 2.0. So you see all the money behind SAS 2.0, so that, that means that's a good thing. So SAS uh, 2.0, SAS 2.0 is where you want to be, kind of, right? I would hope so, but uh, yeah, yeah, I think I, I would hope that the money goes to the right vendors uh, that deliver on this, not uh, yeah, not, not somebody who's uh, creating some painful variant that uh, we're all going to regret uh, in our lifetimes. But anyway, keep going. Yeah, so let's let's um, let's kind of progress through your slideshow a little bit. The second slide is uh, actually a very ugly slide, but that's okay. The rest of the slides are, are are much easier to read. So if you're having trouble reading this slide, don't don't worry. They're not all going to look like this. Hey, don't uh, blame don't blame me. I took this right off of a Diginomica article. Yeah. I, I blame it all on the Diginomica user experience. It's, yeah, so. it's, it's it's our UX that's the problem basically. <laughs> This is my colleague, Phil Wainwright, and what Phil did is he has really fleshed out the concept of, of the age of XSAS, and he wrote a post recently about how 25 years of SaaS are giving way to the XSAS era, and so Brian put together this slide, which can, contains some quotage around that. I won't read the entire slide for you, uh, but I think one of the really big takeaways from Phil's point in, is that now you're talking about a continuous digital connection. So software is not something you just install and use, it's, but it's a continued process. And he talks about engagement. The customer's directly connected to the business every time they use a product or function. Monitor. The business can see how all of its customers are using their products, proactively fix problems, and improve. The direct connection allows the business to update software, offer new capabilities. So that's at the core of what Phil is talking about with this sort of a, uh, that's very, very, very different than, than the SAS of our youth, I guess you could say. Um, so, and, and that kind of fits in with my concepts to some extent, though my focus on legacy SAS was more about sort of business practices and business evolution, but, but the technical evolution isn't complete either, which is kind of Phil's point is that the age of XSAS is still unfolding, but this is sort of a framework for thinking about software that i don't know brian maybe it's more like kind of connective tissue really rather you know you think of like circulation and blood flow between i mean maybe that's the wrong analogy but it's it's not as static as what we what we think of as software traditionally well uh when i read this what i experienced no pun intended was a flashback to the way software used to go down uh, you would have interaction with the vendor uh, just prior to buying it. You'd go through the licensing, and you might have some bouncing around with them during the implementation. But by and large, you know, customers were never and vendors were never meant to be seen together again until that rare event when somebody's looking to uh, maybe do a massive upgrade or uh, change products all the way down the line. So there was no connection, really. I mean, you know, I mean, it was really negligible. This idea that there's a digital connection between the provider and the customer, it's a really interesting idea. I just don't think most vendors who are selling um, cloud-based products today actually thought about this. They're, um, they still act and behave it, with all the bad behaviors and the indifference that they had towards customers back when they sold on-premise products. So mm-hmm. that that part of the experience, oh, they've never touched it. They've never thought about it. They don't know what they're doing here. It's a train wreck out there on the market right now. Yeah, it's a it's little, little more like horse's ass than XS, actually. Um, Greg, Greg Robinett says... SAS X-ray as a service allows rapid self-diagnosis of your osteo value stream in a cost-effective scale manner. You know, 
Greg, it's you're joking, and there's a lot of funny verbiage there. But in a way, that's kind of what Phil is talking about. As although I think he would concede this is mostly an aspirational quality with with most software as it runs today. But so Brian, shall we look at your first actual slide that you created here? Let's go down to the scope of as a service. Well, this looks a little bit like a quadrant, Brian. It's funny how that works, isn't it? You know, I, I wanted to use our patented technology trapezoid that we announced on April Fools, but uh, I had so much to fit in here. I didn't know that it would you know, work in there. However, I'll let you talk about the flavor crystals aspect of it yeah. uh, later in our conversation. Uh, what I like everybody to think about is there's two things related to the experience. Uh, one is what's the value that the customer is getting out of the different components of these as a service, you know, products. And the other one is just how mature have the vendors been able to do that, particularly with the SaaS 1.0 kind of products that are out there. And this is my positioning, if you will. Uh, I would argue if you look up in the, that I don't want to call it a magic quadrant, but up at that top right, that's where I think the vendors did a pretty fair job of getting their core applications and a little bit of the digital connection between the customer and the vendor. They got that. But uh, what's really sad is when you look at like the financial terms over in the top left, they took all of these um, uh, mean-spirited, overly restrictive, punitive kinds of things and contracting capabilities and the like uh, that they had in the on-premise world, and they've brought them right into the as-a-service world. They didn't really rethink anything. Um, if anything, they've added additional little surprises like uh, toll charges and things like indirect access and so forth in there. Uh, if you, I, I comment about how you need you need both an MBA and a um, law degree to understand a SAS contractual arrangement now, and it shouldn't be that bad. And some of the other cells, I think a lot of these SAS 1.0 vendors have not done squat hardly on advanced technologies. I mean, we, we've been hearing people talking about machine learning and the like, and you know, for quite a while, but I'm still waiting for a mainstream vendor to have a whole bunch of processes powered by robotic process automation, having a whole bunch of pre-delivered uh, chat bots and stuff like that that solve a lot of problems. Uh, right now, it's still on the drawing board. The verticals, unless you get to a cloud vendor whose niche is the cloud, like a Plex, I mean, um, a vertical like Plex, uh, most of them haven't done anything in verticals other than to say that we're going to kind of sort of be able to support it through some partners and our toolkit will eventually open it up so partners can build vertical extensions there. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's why almost all of the SaaS products out there only serve service or people-based industries because they're scared to death to deal with the hard industries right but now. Brian, but Brian, what about industry clouds, man? Don't go, don't, no, let's not go there. Um, uh, <laughs> but no, no, I, I just think it's funny though, because this is part of what creates a problem for customers because you're saying that, that these, that the SAS 1.0 vendors, which by the way, are kind of the equivalent of the legacy SAS that I was talking about. You're saying they don't have verticals, but they're, a lot of them are saying they do and they're calling them industry clouds, which again, creates confusion on behalf of the customer because the customer needs to then try to figure out how much is, BS, how much is uh, cumulus and how much is actually, you know, going to rain on them or whatever. I don't know, you know. So if you're a vendor and you have some of your products, like your financial uh, applications, they run in a public cloud, multi-tenant fashion, and you connect them to a single tenant hosted solution that may run on a hyperscaler. And then you've acquired some other products that run in some combination of uh, public cloud or on-prem or whatever. You could call that, you know, it's a marketing deal. You could call it an industry cloud. You could call anything you want. There's no law to pre prevent you from doing that from a marketing perspective. But you really didn't write this stuff from scratch. I mean, the most notable exception lately would be Oracle, who's now got finance, HR, and process, and discrete manufacturing all rewritten and all available in their public cloud solution. But that's the exception. That's not the rule. And I um, and I would agree with Thomas. All these vendors, yeah, they they don't want to 
they don't really want to change. They, they're they all about lock-in, and we'll get into some of that here in just a moment in some subsequent slides. Yeah, and, and, and just to be clear, too, on my view on that, I don't think we're ever going to get rid of lock-in in this industry, but I think what we can shift is more voluntary lock-in. You know, I was uh, reading about this uh, place. I can't remember where it was now. Was it in Japan where you could, like, uh, check into prison for, like, a week or two? And it was, like, soothing because you had a routine? It's voluntary. And I think, like, eventually there's going to be, like, this voluntary thing of I, I trust you to service, provide services as effectively as anyone, so I'm going to choose that. The problem I see right now, Thomas, is that the lock-in that, that the customers experience with a lot of SaaS is not all that different than – the on-prem lock and they were trying to get away from and anyway well, okay well but if if you're offering something as a service then it is your responsibility as that service provider to re-earn the business every yep. single day and Bingo. if you're and if you're re-earning that every day then you don't have to lock people in through contractual and other matters because Bingo. they voluntarily want to be there because you're offering this great service the, yep. the only reason a vendor comes up with these BS ways of locking in is because they don't know the first thing about service. They really don't. Yep. And Greg adds, because the contract is directly linked to who, what entity has responsibility for data protection and security, you have to have a cybersecurity law MBA. Yeah. Okay. Voluntary relocking will require outside and thinking by vendors. Well, Thomas, you've come to the right place. No, no argument there. Uh, I think we need to take that conversation to a few boardrooms uh, to see if they'll. Uh, Let's go to your next slide, Brian. But sure. but uh, but yeah, that theme of earning a customer's business every day—that's a pretty fundamentally mind-blowing concept for our industry. But anyway, so here uh, I'm just picking up on uh, Phil's comment. Uh, con you know where he said this continuous digital connection. And, and I'm like going, well, I think there's a continuous monetary connection and <laughs> the vendors keep finding more and more things to pile on there. Document fees, image fees, uh, subscriber charges, annual increases. It's all about the money. I don't care what, how you want to spin it. It's not the vendor really doesn't care about the digital connection. They care about the monetary connection. That's what it's, you know, that's what it's all about for them. And then there are other monetary connections that go, that work in, where you got to fit in all these implementers, systems integrators. Uh, there's all these charges and things that have to take place for connections to third parties. Uh, it's, it's amazing. And it's all around the money. The one thing no one talks about is on the right hand side here, the brand or experiential connections. I still can't believe that vendors think it's OK to have a massively negative net promoter score. And and John, you and I have had this conversation many times, uh, you know, like we just sit and wonder listening to some ERP vendor lecture us about customer experience and yet they've got a minus 65 net promoter score what the hell do they know about customers uh, you know experience well brian it's sort of like the overweight gym teacher right <laughs> yeah <laughs> well, we'll get you into shape uh anyway uh tom thomas says it would also require drastically change pricing models and value-based pricing well, well yeah indeed i mean look Look, I, I think the way you're putting these points, Thomas, you're putting them like they can never happen. And if I didn't believe that the industry couldn't change, I would I'd just want to walk away today. So I realize that change is hard and sometimes unlikely, but that doesn't mean I'm not going to push for it. Well, and I'd like uh, Thomas to hold that thought because uh, I do have a slide coming up where mm. I, I really want to pound into that that conversation quite a bit. I don't really... I think just changing pricing is that's not the answer. The answer right. is somewhere else, and we'll get to that in a moment. Okay. Shall we progress? Yeah, go for it. All right. SAS 1.0 vendors. Yeah, all right. well, I'm already pounded on uh, the NPS yeah. thing, but um, uh, the reason a lot of change doesn't happen with these vendors is because 
the people that run these companies are not the founders anymore. They disappeared two and three or six management changes uh, ago. What we have are professional managers running a lot of these companies. And the one thing they care about is their personal compensation. And they care about that way more than they care about customer satisfaction. Ouch. And, and well, but it's true. The most powerful and in influential execs I've ever run into in the software industry have almost always been the founders. And and if you or I were having a conversation with them and we told them uh, that there's a problem, man, they moved to heaven and earth and they got it fixed. But generally, professional managers, you know, they just don't hear it because they know they're only going to be in that role maybe three years at the most, and they're all about maximizing their stock options, their share price, and their uh, golden parachute when they're going to get pushed out at some point. Um, the other thing is these larger firms, they they don't care about customers hardly at all because they mostly care about never letting down Wall Street. And so they always have to be within a penny of their expected uh, earnings. And, and it's uh, that focus on delighting Wall Street or su pleasantly surprising them makes them do stupid things short term uh, to customers so they can boost up the, you know, the profits and that causes downstream long-term problems for the customer. I like, uh, I like advanced math and law degrees needed to understand price lists and contracts. Ouch. Well, that's true. And, uh, you know, one of the most difficult things when I sit down with a client to go through, uh, different contracts that are being put in front of my vendors on a uh, selection, uh, you know, the amount of like head shaking, like, what are they talking about here? I mean, you know, there there needs to be like a C spot, C Jane kind of version of these contracts, uh, you know, but the vendors don't want to do that because like I wrote here, opacity is their friend. Anyway, the last point is a lot of these vendors, they for, the, the founders are gone and they've forgotten how to do primary research and build uh, product from scratch. And so they bought a bunch of junk. And then what the customer has to deal with is all of this um, headache related to redundant data models, different data meanings, uh, poor integration, latency, stuff moving back and forth. One of the worst that I saw they had uh, some of the acquired products running on their own private data centers, and they have to ship data out of those data centers to a public uh, cloud provider and sometimes to another one altogether. And I'm like, really, this is this is the value that you're creating this great customer experience by having data latent and redundant all over the world. Yeah, why well, have one customer data platform when you can acquire several? <laughs> yeah. Yeah, I know. Uh, that's what the world needs. We need more of those uh, cloud platform technologies. Um, anyway, right, let's, let's see what's next on your slides of, of death here. Uh, you know, another problem, if you're really customer focused, you'd fix all these kind of integration issues. I don't. I, I can't remember what it was. I know you and I had were in, in some conversation might have been an analyst briefing where we got into a discussion about um, uh, how integrated is something when all you have is uh, like a do-it-yourself toolkit that the customers got to figure right. out or the vendors have to deal with. That's not really that's not really integration. That's the prospect of integration, which is not the same as integration. Um, uh, the other thing that we've I know we've had analysts, we've had these conversations is a lot of the vendors only integrate to their own products, which, okay, that's great if you if you can find me a customer who only has your products. I don't care how big or small the company is, every company I go to has products from multiple different software companies, and they need a way to connect it all together. They don't need a bunch of islands of automation. For more on that, I would refer you to my recent show with Josh on extreme heterogeneity. Yes. Uh, and, uh, you know, it, it's funny, too, because, Brian, one of the things I, I encourage vendors to do, and they never listen, uh, I, what I tell them is, like, at your next show, at your keynote, I want you to show your integration to one of your competitor's products and how, how well it works. 
and show it to customers. And here's the response I get. <laughs> Crickets. Yeah. I get, I get nothing. Although I will say I've seen it once and I saw one vendor. I'm not going to name them because I don't want it to be like a, you know, oh, this is the best vendor. But I saw them do it. It was an integration with another CRM and they did it on stage voluntarily. And I was like, yes. And I think the customers in the audience really appreciated that because they're like, this is a common integration path and, and you addressed it and you didn't pretend like your competitor didn't exist. Anyway, Greg says... The allure of integration is part of a great sales pitch. Well, I think, Greg, what's happened now is we've given way to, oh, we've got modern APIs, so we're good. And you can plug whatever you want in. And, and I think customers are starting to push back and say, you need to assume more responsibility than that. But Yeah, and they want those. Uh, okay, that's fine. The last what? point on this one, uh, I find it particularly galling when uh, in one case it was the CFO of a major vendor was bragging to Wall Street uh, around February of last year about how recession proof their earnings are. We already knew there was a you know a pandemic looming and everything else, but uh, you know as far as not only was this tone deaf, but this just basically proves that they're more focused and care more about what Wall Street thinks of the company as opposed to what customers think. So anyway, let's go on, John. All right. Um, yeah, we can skip this one. I think we've hit some of these already. Now, this goes back to a point uh, Thomas was bringing up about the, the, they wouldn't change pricing. And here's my answer to this. Um, I think a big problem with a lot of vendors is when you try to drag all your old boat anchors from the on-prem world into the cloud world, you brought things like your pricing models, your contracting models, everything else. But what you didn't do is you didn't stop and think, how has the technology world changed in that intervening time frame? And what changed were things like uh, we've seen the price of hardware plummet. We've seen the uh, we see so many data centers disappearing every single week and month now. They're going away as more and more computing loads move to these big utility computing hyperscalers. We see the price of disk storage plummeting it and, 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 and. Everything's getting cheaper and cheaper and some of the development tools are getting way more powerful, which is why we have citizen developer and no code, low code kind of capabilities. All of these trends are happening, but yet the vendors pretend like none of this is going on at all. And what we should be doing as consumers, you know, I push on vendors on this all the time is where is your response in creating a product for consumers or customers that takes advantage of all of these incredible economies of scale and price reductions, price deflationary price activity going on in the market. Uh, in fact, I would challenge, I do this all the time with vendors going, you know, if uh, Moore's law is true, then your software, you know, in 18 months ought to cost about half of what it's costing today. And, and you know, I don't get no, a great, I don't get a great reaction from that comment, but um, you know, and I'm going, and I'm also asking, why aren't you using some of the, no, uh, the open source databases like NoSQL and some of those kind of products in there. Let's get the cost to instantiate a new version of your product as close to zero as possible. I don't know why they can't do that. And the reason they can't is because they continue to have this fixation and this attachment to the old world that they are not willing to change. I think a lot of these vendors are the flat earthers of the technology world. There's your sound bite for today. Thomas says, uh, oh, the flat earthers, ouch. That is only part of the problem. Main thing is to transfer value from customer to vendor happens far earlier than getting value from the software. Uh, yeah, particularly, well, the particularly only thing if you prepay like a five-year cloud uh, deal. Uh, yeah, you transferred a whole lot of value to the vendor uh, before you ever realize it. Yeah, you're absolutely right on that. The only thing, Thomas, is you're assuming that they are, they are going to get value from the software, which is not always true. Yeah. In, in, in fact, I think a lot of times the when, when I look into customer use cases, it's it's the more mature customers that have extracted the value 
far, far after go live. And not all of the mature customers either, because it's not just how long you've been on a, on a platform. It's how hard you work at it. I just did this thing on Disney and Workfront and their team and, and how they struggle with adoption. It took them some years to actually really extract the value from the platform, even though that's a good platform, but it doesn't mean be, because you have a good platform that you're going to have an inherently successful experience. But anyway, let's go on to uh, your next one. Well, this is just showing that, you know, in nature, you see all kinds of things evolve and animals constantly evolve new techniques to either avoid capture or to prey on uh, their victims. Uh, hey, did you get a, the, the colorful plumage? Is that like a, that's kind of like a trade show thing, right? Uh, oh, yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> it's for the vendors with the unlimited uh, marketing budget. That's TV advertising for them. Um SaaS vendors, uh, they uh, they adapted a bunch of things, most of which came from the old world, and they've taken them to new and even more punitive levels. And the SaaS 2.0 vendors, I think, should be going a completely different direction. And what we ought to be having a conversation with vendors about is what are you going to do with an ex you know with a widening gap between or chasm between the 1.0 and 2.0 you know deals so i think some of these vendors think they're going to be able to slap a bunch of spackle in that uh, gap and somehow manage to continue to be relevant when they have never bothered to, to address their customer experience their uh their lack of utilization of open source and low cost kind of things and to get economies of scale so if I had more time, I'd build a chasm between 1.0 and 2.0. And the real discussion is, what are the 1.0 vendors going to do about those things? Yeah, because because Brian, wouldn't you say that one of the encouraging things about our industry is that there are some vendors that are actually really pressing the issue now and and adapting some of these 2.0 tactics. I, I, we're starting to see more of it. I don't think we're necessarily seeing vendors that have put it all together. But we're starting to see different components of, of these 2.0 practices, and I think that's refreshing to see when we do see it. I would agree. I, I know you don't want me to name names, but, yeah, you and I both know there's one. There's a great one that's uh, doing a lot of that kind of stuff down in uh, Texas. There's a couple of them in the mid-market that are doing a really good job of this and are really embracing the customer experience aspect of it. So, yes, there is some progress in there, but... Uh, it's the indifference, particularly of the publicly traded vendors, that is really galling. Uh, yep. you know, and they're the ones that need to be taken to the woodshed for a really good switching. A, an unpleasant barbecue, basically. Not not one of the good barbecues that we used to have on the road, but mm -hmm. an unpleasant barbecue, in, indeed. Well, that what else we got here? I think we're getting close to the end of my deck. Yeah, yeah. Got, this, this is not going to be a 50-slide 50, uh, 50 deck, y'all, so we're getting towards the end of Brian's slides. By the way, I did a 67-slide presentation last night. At one Ouch. Of uh, that was, uh, that yeah, was brutal. Um, sorry, I missed that. No, you're not. Uh, no, but uh, it was the future of work, but it should have been the future of presentations is what it should have been, you know, at that length. Anyway, um, evolution and choice. And I think this is something interesting. Uh, you know, there, the two concepts are different. One's about adapting to uh, a changing kind of a competitive environment. What are you going to do about it? And the others are the choices you're going to make. And I think a lot of this stuff on experience, it's a combination of both. Are you going to, you you have choices as a vendor as to how you want to uh, interact with customers. And I think customers also have choice. You don't have to accept things from the big bad boys out there just because that's what you've always used or that's what everyone else in your industry used those are pitiful reasons for continuing on with a bad vendor who treats you even worse that's like saying i'm going to stay married to my spouse abusing um uh you know mate because i've always been married to him no kick them to the curb show them the highway and move on and you know make your life better Oh, very good, Greg. Very good. I like that. VSAS, vendor. vendor switching as a service. Yeah, I like that. Um, 
Anyway, but this is the this to me is uh, the the guts of this deal here. It's we got to see how much vendors are going to evolve and how much they're going to let choice that's informed by the changing market drive uh, the way they're going to modify and adapt their products. Yeah, and what do you think the some of the customer takeaways are here? I mean, to, in my mind, some of the customer takeaways are cast a wider net when you're evaluating vendors, uh, cast a wider net when you bring in systems integrators, and try to become uh, sharper in terms of how you press vendors on these questions when you're either renewing or upgrading because it's those moments of truth, those contractual moments of truth that bind you for to- many times to come. I would, uh, I'll echo your comments. I had a couple th- thoughts. Um, but my botanic, okay, that very cute, Thomas. Um, what I would add is. I think it's very important at the onset of a new selection to dictate your terms to the vendors. Tell them that you will not accept contracts that have embedded URLs, that you will not accept contracts that uh, charge you uh, not only a subscription, but all these other kind of uh, tolls and other indirect charges that you're not going to do. You're not going to deal with it. If that's the only way they're going to you know, interact, then you tell them, sorry, but we're going to, in the words of Dear Abby, seek true love elsewhere and send them packing. You'll be amazed how quick some of them will come running back and they'll still try to convince you that, it, no, you need to buy their solution because their solution is better, but you have to remind them not with those terms. So they need to do a better job of coming up with something uh, that you find acceptable. I always outline this kind of stuff about what we will or will not accept from a contract or re- economic relationship with a vendor. And, uh, you know, and I always get these, oh, tearful, you know, teary eyed stories from salespeople about how, you know, but that's just not the way we do it. And that's the way all the other vendors do it. And, you know, they come up with a million excuses. And I've heard better stories pitched by fifth graders as to why, you know, they didn't get their homework done overnight. They don't want to change because that would require approvals and discussions within their firm. Uh, they just want you to, you know, suck it up and accept the standard junk that they cram down the throats of every other customer. Not that I have an opinion on this matter, uh, but you need to you need to step up and tell them no. And the more people to do it, the better. Yeah, I wish you'd brought some opinions today, Brian. It would have helped. Uh, yeah, and you know, I think what's interesting too, and Thomas's comment, his joking comment about let my bot negotiate with your bot. I think there's something there actually, Brian, because what what I think a lot of vendors do in this situation is they, instead of really getting at the core of this flawed customer relationship, they they slather on additional technology and present that as the progress that they think customers need, right? So mm-hmm. check our latest AI tool or, yeah, now you don't have to sign the contract because a bot will do it for you but they don't fundamentally address the underlying problem or experience. One of the things I talk with vendors about is like, instead of selling transformation, show your customers how you're transforming. The assumption is that the, that the vendors already transformed, but I think in most cases they have not. I would agree. Greg says, SAS 2 requires more customer due diligence and a more critical approach for optimal value, Laxine trying to map your on-prem procurement process to SAS hurts you, helps the vendors. I mean, I, I do think, Greg, you have a couple important points there, and part of making this work is is customers taking a more involved role in their in their own uh, projects because certainly there's no no vendor, not even the, the ones that Brian are referring to that we like a lot, no vendor is above some careful scrutiny and management by the end customer and unfortunately I think I think one of the reasons why I sort of was pressed in this issue with legacy SaaS is like let's sort of not have any industry darling vendors anymore let's bring everyone down to the same level and and treat them as like Brian said earn 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 biz, earn my business every day Brian we got another slide here this is the uh, grand finale I think the evolution continues. 
Yeah, and I, you know that second point. I think a lot of these vendors they have to decide which path they want to go down. Do they want to evolve or do they want to stay the same? And if we've learned anything in nature, if you choose to remain constant, you tend to get eclipsed by a superior whatever uh, version of you that's out there in the market. Um, and I think they've got some choices to make, some of which you know involve like. I put here a moral compass or ethics, you know, which is kind of lacking from some of these vendors or even compassion. I would, I would love that. Uh, I'd love to see a vendor that actually has real compassion. The fact that we had guys like you and I were just beating on vendors ma uh, massively last spring and summer about what are you going to do to let customers scale up or scale down with your licenses because the pandemic's impact on businesses. The fact that we had to press them on those points and, you know, tells you that they really weren't thinking about the customer. They were thinking about themselves first. So, so what do you think about this, this notion of wall street, right? Because if you're a publicly traded company, you do have, responsibilities to investors. So what is a better way of balancing that? Is it even possible, do you think? I think the, I think the problem is uh, you've either got short-termism with some of the management in there. I think some of them don't think they have the protection of the board to do the right things long-term. Mm -hmm. And I think that's a real mistake. Um, and I think if you spend all your quarter figuring out how you're going to hit that um, pre-announced earning kind of target for Wall Street, then I think you're letting a lot of the bigger stuff slide on through. And that's a problem. Um, anyway, I, I, I think Wall Street is not as stupid as people think it is. Uh, you know, I think if you if you have a compelling vision and a story on where you're trying to take a company, uh, yeah, I mean, they may they may punish your stock somewhat for a couple of quarters, but when they start to see the results, that's what causes things to go, you know, uh, amazingly uh, up. There's a reason why, think about how long Amazon never made a profit or whatever, and yet people continue to keep bidding up the stock price. Why? Because they believed in the vision of where Bezos and the gang were going to take the company. So I think if you're that terrified that Wall Street's going to punish you, it's probably because you have done a terrible job of articulating a winning vision. And in particular, if you're a vendor that's got nothing but a bunch of like on-prem and SaaS 1.0 kind of products, you, d you haven't earned the credibility with Wall Street that you even know how to build a 2.0 kind of product line. So you're kind of screwed all the way around. So, so Thomas, Thomas says, shouldn't should Wall Street success, success or executive, executive comp be a result of concentrating on the customer? In an ideal world, that'd be great. Um, <laughs> Wouldn't it? You know, there was a book that uh, Michael Tracy and Fred Wurzma wrote 20 odd years ago. It was called The Discipline of Market Leaders. And they opined that there are only three kinds of companies out there. You're either customer intimate like Nordstrom, process excellent like Walmart, or a product innovator like Intel. And to a lot of these software companies, they think they are uh, innovators. And maybe they were 20, 30, 40 years ago, but they lost that innovation edge a long time ago. So if they're not innovators and they, they innovate by buying companies, they're an M&A firm, then that tells me they're probably not process excellent either. And I don't think they're customer intimate. So in a world where companies need to pick a lane and dive in deep on that, I think a lot of these tech vendors don't know who they are. They don't know what their main market discipline is going to be. They're not, because uh, I can tell you right now, we know they're not customer intimate. We know they're not process excellent. And we know they're not innovators. So I think that's the challenge for a lot of these folks. And that's why they don't have credibility on Wall Street. And it's why companies like shareholder activist firms find some of these companies so attractive because they know they're a mess from a management direction perspective. And they think, you know, this is a company that had its day, it peaked, and now it needs to be harvested. So these activist shareholders get in there and they're going to now start cutting off any more future R&D because it's not paying any dividends anyway. And, uh, and instead return that capital back to shareholders. And that's when you know, 
uh, somebody needs to put a fork in your ERP vendor when you've got shareholder activists circling the carcass. Yeah, as the world is not ideal, says Thomas. Wall Street is analyst and short-term driven. How much chance to change to incumbent vendors have? I mean, I think that's kind of what Brian was addressing a little while ago as far as if you create a narrative that makes sense to Wall Street and take a few hits if you have to, then then maybe you do have that opportunity. I, I, what, what, what I have found is that a lot of vendors don't push back enough on Wall Street with a, with a, narr with a counter narrative. They just accept the fact that, that their earnings multiples aren't good enough and they go about seeking margin efficiencies and cutting costs when they should be investing in product. So I, I'm gonna, I will use a real example here. There's a company called Ceridian, which has been around forever, but they brought in a, they bought a company called Dayforce uh, to handle uh, cloud-based payroll and HR. And they made the CEO of the acquired company, the CEO of Ceridian. And this guy transformed that company and took a very moribund kind of payroll outsourcer, payroll service providing firm for the most part, and has turned it into a juggernaut in the uh, cloud HRMS space. You can do it, but it takes a leader with some vision and, uh, and drive to make it happen. It can't be by someone who thinks the way to, uh, you know, the way to success is by you know, cajoling uh, Wall Street analysts and financial analysts, that's not going to get you very far. Anyway, you can close that deck out, uh, John. I think we've covered all the main stuff there. So, I like your, your pot, of, pot of gold at the end there. That's that's nice, though. Yeah, I took that. That was a picture I took in a museum in, I want to say, Gothenburg or Stockholm or somewhere like that. But it was in, it was in the Nordics. I remember that much. Well, um, Thomas is saying it is extremely hard to swim against that strong current, John. Well, Thomas Bryan just gave you an example of a company that did. So, again, we are uh, we're not accepting fatalism in this conversation. Uh, I understand that the odds can be difficult, but we're we're, reject, we're rejecting fatalism today. Sorry. <laughs> uh, I'll accept realism, uh, but uh, not fatalism. But yeah, well, okay. well, sure, sure. I think privately held companies have an advantage here thomas but i'm not willing to accept that we are going to write off publicly held companies because unfortunately the vast majority of software companies in the future are going to be enterprise software companies are going to be publicly held so if we write them off as inherently corrupt then we're all screwed we might as well just either cash our paychecks or go home so so brian uh switching gears slightly what are you working on man what now that we've like basically deconstructed the industry what what is uh what is stimulating your intellectual curiosity? What, what what kind of stuff are you digging into? I'm doing a ton of stuff on HR at the moment. And uh, here's a piece that caught my attention. There's a story about to help workers, Walmart's going to move more and more into full time. And uh, Amazon's doing some interesting moves and others. Because if you thought we had a war for talent before the pandemic, that was just a skirmish. Now it's just full on turmoil in the labor markets right now. Um, uh, there's, it, it's been surprising to me how many subtleties there are as we start thinking about uh, the return to work. And some of your colleagues over Diginomica, I, I think it was either, I can't remember if it was Stuart or um, uh, who else. Uh, anyway, they, they coined a phrase, the vaccine economy. Yep, that's our Stuart. Yep, and I love that. I'm gonna be I'm gonna be writing that in on a whole bunch of stuff um, because I'll let him know the royalty checks are coming. He'll be psyched. <laughs> well, I see a few of your guys uh, also steal a lot of content out of my piece. Uh oh, uh -oh. So smash I talk. Uh oh, I, I haven't seen those royalty checks come in yet. Uh, out the other way, but um, no, but uh, you know I. There's a lot of conversation people talk about. Well, what do we do as we go back to kind of a, a return to work or what have you? And uh, I, I'll just say that the 
the things you have to think through from a managerial perspective beyond all the the tactical stuff about how do we let people in the building how do we still space them out do they still wear masks i'm, I'm not even going to go there i mean there's a million of those kind of things but there are questions like what do you do if you have a colleague who for, has some pre-existing health condition and cannot or should not let's put it that way come into the office whereas others might come in a couple days a week and I don't think we're going to see a lot of absolutes like people must come in the office on Mondays and Tuesdays every week. You're not going to see that. There are also some real challenges with recruiting. There was a headline on um, HR Tech, uh, or excuse me, HR Executive Magazine the other day. It says if you de if you demand workers start coming back to the office, expect 58 percent of them to quit. So. I don't know how many companies can afford to lose that many workers. So uh, we've got, um, we, we need to really think about how do we really deal with this? I did a piece recently about alumni and what surprised me, what always surprises me is when you write something, the emails or whatever that you get back channel, somebody finds just some aspect of what you write about and they want to correspond with you about it. And what they want to write about, or, you know, like on that one about alumni, somebody guessed incorrectly as to who I used to work for because I talked about how my old employer's alumni system is kind of a, a waste of money, I guess. And uh, they made some assumptions thinking I was talking about another firm. Anyway, I set them straight on that. But anyway, it's always interesting. All they have to do is read your bio. But but it's true. You, on 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 your Diginomica content, you did the alumni piece. But you, I was looking through a minute ago. A lot of your recent pieces have been about various aspects of HR, including the uh, mythology of employee experience, uh, why uh, employee well-being in a post-COVID corporate culture matters more than ever. So it sounds like we're going to have to have you back in a little bit for a return to work blowout, where we can go over some of those. Yeah, we could talk about that. The other, the other interest area I've been uh, up to my eyeballs and things about like fixed asset, not fixed asset, but uh, yeah, fixed asset accounting and cost accounting. But you know, uh, you you can't you can't pay people to probably listen in on a podcast about that kind of a conversation. So um, maybe we will do the HR one instead. Um, we we could try it. We could try <laughs> we could try paying people to listen. <laughs> I, then I would question your business model, John, uh, very much so. Oh, here's um, an interesting one from, from Greg. Recent issue, team wanted to meet in person, one refused vaccination, meeting held with restricted protocols because of non-vaccinator, all future in-person meetings canceled. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's a real challenge. Um, uh, I, I understand there are going to be people that can't take a vaccine because of some kind of uh, health issue or whatever, but there's just some that are just doing this kind of stuff to be hard headed, or whatever. And, um, uh, you know, and, it, and these are the kind of issues that are going to cause, you know, um, downstream problems for employers and you're going to have to have a response for them. I, you know, when you're, when you're answering that, I'm just thinking about the poor beleaguered HR professional who doesn't exactly have a fun job to begin with and they're not that well paid either. And now they have to like navigate like people who refuse to be vaccinated and come to meetings. I mean, that is just that is a handful. Well, just that is an absolutely handful. Just imagine this: you're an HR recruiter, and you want to bring somebody in to meet the team they're going to work with. And you're and you know what are you going to do? You're going to ask them point blank. You have been vaccinated, haven't you? And or what if they lied? I mean, people. I know it's hard to believe this, John, but I've actually heard that some people lie on their resumes, and uh, you know, and I suspect they'll lie on their uh, on their vaccination stuff. In fact, I have a book here from a guy oh, you named. You have that on the shelf. I have a book nice. here called. Um, let's see the title of it here. Yeah, it's called "Resumes from Hell" by a guy named John Reed, <laughs> and. Um, oh my goodness. And, uh, you know, it's hard to imagine that people actually would tell some great whoppers. Uh, th although I did see in one of your recent, um, uh, it was either in your hits, myths, and whiffs and thing, or it was on Twitter, somebody who wrote a programming language 
saw a job ad that he wasn't qualified to respond to, even though he yeah. wrote the language. Uh, yeah. The employer wanted somebody with like twice or three twice. times, twice the, the experience. experience. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Of, the, <laughs> of how long the language actually existed. Yeah. And he's like, hmm, that's weird. I, I feel like underqualified here for the language that I, the programming language that I created in the job spec. Yeah, resume some hell is good times. Yeah, that's, Actually, that's fun. Bet you can't believe I could put my finger on it that fast. I'm, I'm, I'm impressed, dude. That that's cool. I appreciate it. Uh, yeah, Greg, we'll have to uh, bring you bring you back in for some more comments if we do a return to work thing in a in a little bit. I think it would be good to do that. Um, I've, I've been compiling a few uh, sort of scenarios from different vendors as well, and I don't think there's really a lot of easy answers to this stuff yet. Um, so, the, And all of these actually have, um, there's some really interesting technology implications um, uh, that are going to impact uh, as we, we're not all going to go back to work from the office. We're not going to all stay work from home. We're going to have all these blended deals. But some of the things nobody talks about are like, what we didn't do well with the work from home movement was to uh, make people's home offices highly productive. And you'd be surprised how many people in home offices, particularly outside of the United States, they didn't have broadband. Um, they can't do a Zoom call because they're still running on something that's almost like, uh, you know, 200 baud kind of lines. Uh, we need to have like a 5G capability or like one gigabit uh, per second bandwidth, uh, probably in the home office for people. And it varies a bit by the kind of worker that you have. So what we never came up with was a concept called the bill of materials for the remote worker. And different kinds of workers need a different kit. And employers yep. didn't do that. So, Including a firewall that their kids can't get into when they're gaming and stuff. Yeah, you and I are aware of a CEO uh, who had to get a cable company come back out and install a second broadband line with a dedicated router and server and everything else just for him because his kids were uh, screwing kids him were over. Yeah. Taking, taking down his meetings. Yeah. Zoom can't compete with like high bandwidth gaming connections and stuff. So, but you actually just gave me an idea for your cost accounting thing. We can trick people because we can do, we can do a thing on five G and 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 sensor technology. And then once we get going, it'll all be about cost accounting and how the whole point of all this technology on on shop floors and out in uh, locations is to is to measure batch profitability and and uh, traceability of products. So we can trick people into a cost accounting discussion with five G as the as the sex appeal should work great. <laughs> yeah, that's that's what I really want to be known for, tricking yeah. people into an accounting talk. Uh, Ladies yeah. and gentlemen, Brian Summer, 5G enthusiast. I mean, don't get me wrong. I'm, I'm all about, you know, great bandwidth and everything else. But um, uh, but you're right. I mean, there's there's actually a lot of a lot of need for that kind of technology on the shop floor. And yep. uh, uh, and we're going to see a lot more of it. Uh, one other thing I did want to point out. Oh, yeah, blockchain. I can't believe no one mentioned it up till now. Thank you, Greg, because uh, I know that's uh, John's favorite word. Uh, well, it, it's funny. If I mention traceability, uh, someone's going to mention blockchain right away because whenever you bring up traceability, <laughs> you got to throw blockchain at that one for sure. <laughs> nice, nice job, Greg, violating the rules of, of the show. Good, good work. <laughs> Good work. Well, I don't know what our phrase that pays or anything else or any uh, magic. Um, yeah, we didn't buzzwords. use that many. We didn't use that many buzzwords today. I, I don't think I can really uh, justify justify the uh, the bell today. Mm. I think we're going to have to work a little harder next time. Well, I knew this was going to be a bit more somber and. Uh, yeah, but but it is what it is. I mean that that's the subject you, you you wanted to talk about it. That's what it is. The five G blockchain special. You know, Greg, that's the kind of thing that belongs in a product like Astounding ERP. You know, the same from the same people who brought you the technology trapezoid, the most incredible analyst ranking tool on the planet today. Am I right, John? <laughs> right, you are. 
And and look, I mean, look, it's a sobering topic what we talked about today in some ways, but I think also to me it's uh I I get excited about it because I think it's the potential to really deliver on on good projects that make a difference for people. And and we need those right now, you know, like there's some really cool stories right now. I mean, it, you know, just just at the Adobe Summit this week, really cool stories. I mean, even like interviewing a Pfizer and AstraZeneca, like some of the amazing things that happen with turning around that vaccine technology in such a short time. You know, these are the kinds of things we dreamed about in our industry that we could someday accomplish. And so it's not all bad. It's just, uh, I, I just, I just get frustrated a little bit with the hypocrisy of talking about customer experience while your own customers are having such a flawed relationship with you. So that's all. I just feel like that needs work. Well, if you want anyway. to close on, if you want to close on a positive note, uh, I will. Yeah, what say, you got? I, I was just saying, I, I want to build up on your Adobe deal. I, I still think Workfront was a, a great deal for them to pick up on because what it does is it it allows companies to operate at the speed of business. It takes friction out all over the place. It makes things happen and move, and. Uh, that's in stark contrast to the ossifying nature of so many of the products that we uh, that we deal with. Well, we got a lot of comments coming in now. Yeah, yeah, Thomas. On on regarding outside pressure, obviously, I don't think any. There's no regulatory pressure that can solve the problems I'm referring to today, for the most part. Uh, so, so it's you know, aside from ensuring that there's not monopolistic situations, um, but but for the most part, the outside pressure is going to come from companies are, that are doing it better, which is why I referred to the fact that there are some of those today. I just don't want to name names because a lot of them are Diginomica partners, and I don't want this to seem like a commercial because that's not why I'm doing this. Um, good tech takes the pandemic. Um, yeah, it's interesting, Greg. I mean, I think obviously the pandemic provoked a lot of realization in a lot of companies that 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 there is a transformation imperative, which is something that before the pandemic, I did run into a lot of companies that just didn't really feel any kind of urgency around anything that you would talk about with digital or or would you like to sell directly to customers or and all those things obviously were forced into focus. But um, I, I don't know. I mean, I think human beings often respond in some ways better to crisis than they do to normalcy. And I think crisis brought out the best in certain companies uh now now look they had a profit motive let's not pretend like they didn't um you know successful vaccine technology is going to make these companies a lot of money but 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 i think there's also some heroism involved in, in a lot of the stuff that happened so new market entrants are outside pressure too yes indeed yeah that's the whole uh you're you're hitting on the Michael Porter of five competitive forces model right there. New entrants, uh, your suppliers, your customers uh, that can disintermediate you, take you right out of the middle. They're the traditional competitors, and, and then there's uh, uh, I'm drawing a blank. Uh, it's, get, it's the end of the week. What can I say? But anyway, there were five of them. There, uh, kudos to Michael Porter on that. Well, all right, Brian. I think we got it, man. Thanks for the slides. I really appreciate you uh, taking those ideas and codifying them into something we could share with, with a broader audience. Much appreciated. Um, if I can do one thing quick, it's build a PowerPoint deck. Uh, but that's kind of not a skill set I want to brag about. But uh, anyway, I uh, hope it helped move the conversation along. As always, thanks for bring bring me on board uh, once again, John. And uh, don't hesitate to call me in the future. Absolutely. I'd like to thank uh, Thomas and Greg uh, for your uh, for your leadership in the chat today as well. Uh, thanks for keeping things lively for us. Nice job. Yeah. Catch you guys later. All right.